Dogs got birdie a few times, a few non-productive points. Really like what we saw throughout walking here. We saw a little bit of everything, ton of food out here, beggar's lice, everything out here. I mean, it just, it, it looks great. The dogs covered the ground really well. They hunted really well and uh, just couldn't come up with anything. A couple non-productive points got exciting for a few times, but other than that, we uh, came up short. Hunt something that looks great, even enjoyable to walk, and just no birds. Unfortunately, it's a story that we hear all too often, especially as upland hunters that live east of the Mississippi. States and regions that were once known and coveted for its upland hunting opportunities no longer are. We recently just spent four or five days hunting hard in areas we know used to house birds. We hunted public as well as private land in the state of Illinois, a state that calls itself the Prairie State. But driving through it, it doesn't take anybody to realize there's not any prairies left. A state that used to have over 21 million acres of prairie now are around 2,000 acres. So what happened? This question led me to try and find answers. This led us to the Prairie Ridge State Natural Area where we were introduced to Bob Gillespie, who has devoted his career and life in trying to save the last remaining population of prairie chickens within the state. A species that once had millions across the landscape are now under 200 birds. As you watch this video, you're gonna hear Bob explain what happened throughout history that got us to this point, the steps that he's taken to try and conserve and salvage what remaining population that he does have in Illinois, as well as the lessons that we all hope as conservationists and hunters, we take to heart and hopefully use and apply in other areas of the country to prevent this from happening again. I am the site manager here at Prairie Ridge State Natural Area. It's a site that's administered by the Illinois Department of Natural Resources. So I'm a biologist or ecologist for Illinois Department of Natural Resources. I'm with the Heritage Division. So Prairie Ridge is one of our uh, flagship grassland areas in the state. All right, so it's a larger grassland complex and we manage it for grassland wildlife. We have some different partners that are active on the area. Illinois Audubon Society is, is one that's very important to the uh, development and, and maintenance and, and, uh, uh, of this area. And Prairie Ridge is a, is a patchwork of different habitat types, different tracts of grassland that, that are scattered um, in two counties in Illinois. So we've got our Jasper County unit, and then we also have our Marion County unit. They're about 30 miles apart or so. You know, we probably have maybe 20 different tracks here in Jasper County and, and probably about 10 or so different tracks in Marion that are okay. disparate of each other. So about 30 different tracks yeah. and across all 30 different tracks, what's the population of prairie chickens that are left around about? Do y'all have an exact number or just kind of a, we, a ballpark? We do the best we can to census them pretty uh, extensively. Right now we're probably running about 200 total birds. Historically, what was the population of prairie chicken like and what did it mean on the landscape for the people that first came here settling? Well, that's the neat thing. Historically, and, and we're talking at settlement, there was 10 to 14 million greater prairie chickens in Illinois. So that's hard to even wrap your head around, right? Yeah. But that was a tremendous amount of birds. And if you think about it, greater prairie chickens are really important at settlement because a lot of those birds fed our early settlers. And then, you know, in the market hunting era, greater prairie chickens, they come out and they would, they would kill them by the cord or the ton. Yeah. And they would ship them to St. Louis or Indy or Chicago or I, And I think that's something that's kind of lost on the average citizen is yeah. prairie chickens were a delicacy that were on menus oh, yeah. in restaurants. Absolutely. When, when they first settled here, like, yeah. like you just said, pioneers relied on it, not, not just to feed their families, but a source of income as well. They're selling them to the markets. Yeah. And, and it's kind of like, you know, you hear all the time about passenger pigeons or even buffalo. Mm -hmm. You don't hear very often about the truckloads of prairie chicken That's being right. sent out. That's right. And quail. And, and I mean, they made use of just about any organs that right. they could, of course, as you know. Um, but, you know, even if you look back at the different historical documents, you know, you look back at, uh, you know, the, the journals of Lewis and Clark, they even talk about prairie chicken. You know, they talk about seeing them or their hunters coming back in with them. And um, 
And the neat thing is greater prairie chickens were very, very widely dispersed historically. I mean, the range essentially extended all the way into Canada extensively and all the way to Texas, to the coast of Texas, basically. And then we also had um, species of prairie chickens on the eastern seaboard, the heath hen. So this was an organism that was so widely dispersed historically. So today we always talk about the northern bob white kind of being this expansive species that's been kind of all over the country. Right. But it sounds like if you go back in time, you have if you had a time machine and you come back out in the early 1800s, sure. it kind of sounds like the prairie chicken actually had a wider range than even the northern bob white. Would you say that's accurate? I would say that could that could be accurate. Yes. Um, if you think about it, we had, um, you know, at settlement or just shortly before settlement, we had more grassland. One thing that did happen, interestingly enough, is that at settlement or just after, especially here in Illinois, you had some of the prairies that were being utilized for early, early, let's say, farming operations. You know, mom and pop set, settle in on the prairie and they broke some of the prairie areas and, and you got kind of an interfluve of smaller farms then. And at that time you had kind of, a, you know, you had small grains that were introduced into the area and a little bit of disturbance and greater prairie chickens utilized that. And their numbers actually during that time reached wow. their main peak. So greater prairie chickens to some extent and kind of like Bob White, desire a little bit of disturbance within their habitat. So when when we go back in time, you know, like you said, there's all kind of horse, historical references because this bird meant so much to pioneers when they first came over here. I mean, honestly, you could argue that probably we as a species don't migrate west in the U.S. at least as quickly as we did without the prairie chickens being on the landscape. Mm -hmm. You start reading some of those and you, you can reference certain facts like that there's references to seeing them perched on rail fences going greater than a half a mile. And so for those people listening or, or maybe watching this, it, like you said, it's hard to wrap your head around millions of birds. Sure. Picture a fence on the side of the road that goes going on for more than a half a mile and it's just birds lined up along top of it. It's, it's insane to think Absolutely. about. When was it that the red flag went off that people started noticing, hey, the the fence rail isn't lined with prairie chickens for half a mile anymore. When did it start becoming noticeable to where maybe we need to start putting in some regulations or, sure. or some just social boundaries right. to hopefully kind of curb the just drop off? I, I'm gonna put it on a kind of a different time frame here, all right? Think about Aldo Leopold when he, when he was a conservationist. All right. During that time frame, one of the things that Aldo Leopold did is he cut his teeth on lots of different game species. But one of the species that we don't realize that he worked with a lot was greater prairie chickens. Okay. So Aldo was, you know, 1940s, 1950s, kind of like that, perhaps. And if you look back at some of the records of the booming ground surveys, from Illinois and particularly into Indiana, you will see, you will see Aldo Leopold, his name, and the number of chickens that he observed. So Aldo Leopold was an early conservationist, right? And even at that time, they were conducting surveys for prairie chickens and even seeing that, wow, these populations are changing on the landscape and they're dwindling, okay? And then in Illinois, we established hunting seasons in the in the 40s and even then we were starting to see man these populations are getting hammered these birds aren't doing well and there were a couple different reiterations where we would open a season for a while and then we were like gosh i don't know and, and they would close down. it and then a couple years down the road, they would have like a little opener of a season for a few days, and then they closed it. And then finally, they just did away with the hunt program entirely. Some might say, if it's been 70 years and we're and these are the results that we have, sure. economically speaking, why do we keep still trying to do that? 
Well, let's put it a different way. Yes. Greater Prairie Chickens should be very illustrative for anybody that's wanting to conserve anything. So you guys like to hunt Bob White Quail. Lots of people do. Are they doing well on the landscape now? They're not, are they? So what I like to tell folks is Greater Prairie Chickens are conservation reliant. They require us to be aggressive conservationists and managers. We have a whole lot of other species that are in the same boat and they're just a little farther back in the train, if you will. Right. You know, they're moving towards a situation where their numbers are really dwindling on the landscape. And I'll come at it a different way also. Greater prairie chickens are important wherever they are. I mean, we're, we're hunters, we're conservationists, we're people that enjoy natural communities. We value those organisms, right? So greater prairie chickens have a place in our natural world. And we have areas in the United States where they are still doing okay where we have core populations that are still huntable, right? Right. But those populations, we need to keep them that way. We need to keep them as healthy as they can. And we don't know what challenges those core populations will have in the future. So it's important to conserve those organisms, greater prairie chickens, wherever they occur. So here in Illinois, they have a certain genetic signature and they have certain haplotypes that are important for the genetic health of greater prairie chickens at all across the landscape. So for us to keep that genetic health alive is very important because down the road, we don't know what conservation will really require of us. So short term or short sightedness, somebody might look at this and be like, man, we're throwing a lot of money at this and we're never going to be able to hunt these birds more than likely, right. uh, uh, you know, statistically realistically, speaking, realistically right. speaking, there may never be somebody that can legally hunt prairie chickens in Illinois again. Yep. But long term thinking, bigger picture thinking, mm -hmm. it's a billboard to not just the prairie chicken in South Dakota right. or the Sand Hills in Nebraska, yep. but the bob white quail or even the wild turkey that's yes. having an issues and struggles across the landscape yes. now. And so it's more about just a billboard and a warning. And people talk about bellwether species. You betcha. This is pretty much kind of the first of the bellwether species almost. Right, right. And the thing of it that's, that's particularly scary to me is that greater prairie chickens are really kind of a generalist grassland species. You know, if you provide good quality grassland, they do well, but it has to be um, of, suffi of sufficient quantity and quality. And in Illinois, we just don't have that anymore. By doing this work on the prairie chickens and, and con trying to conserve what's left of them or preserve them really here, sure. what are the other species that are benefiting from that work on this landscape? There are, there are several different species that benefit from that and, and it's, it's not just avian species. Um, you know, we're, we're conserving, you know, prairie cicadas and and we're, you know, we're working with ornate box turtles, you know, I mean, there's a lot of species that, you know, and, and, you know, when we were walking out here on top of this hill, we saw a harrier go by, you know, and we have short-eared owls that come up in the evening, we see them, we got barn owls, we got barn owl, owl boxes scattered across the area that get great use. Uh, you know, we have, we have loggerhead shrikes that use the area from time to time. Here, here at Prairie Ridge, we've got a lot of uh, wetland areas that are, you know, prairie pothole type wetlands, and they have all sorts of different rails and water bird species that are imperiled also. What What is the overlap with other game species, such as Bob White Quail with prairie chickens? Because you, you referenced them earlier, grasslands. Mm -hmm. Bob White Quail are associated with grasslands, even though they're a shrubland obligate, right. we associate them with grasslands. We have several different coveys scattered throughout throughout my sanctuaries and they utilize a lot of the same cover types that the greater prairie chickens do and, and you'll find them out in the meadows you'll find them in areas that i've prepared um, for brood cover for prairie chickens you know a, a mama bob white quail or take her little chicks into that in that cover also and if you think about it they're both looking for a brood cover of certain types. So it'll have overhead screen, but it'll be very 
clear on the ground where the young animals can move through it. So you'll see bobwhite quail and greater prairie chickens utilizing the same cover there. A lot of times, you know, we talk about bobwhite quail and, and a covey headquarters. You may have heard that terminology yeah. where they'll use a, a, a plum thicket or, a, you know, down tree structures or, you know, uh, some brushy cover, uh, especially during really rough weather, you'll find them in there a lot. But that's one thing that, that bobwhite quail use a lot. You'll also see prairie chickens that will use that. You know, a lot of times you'll see um, the female prairie chickens in the wintertime, they will bud and they'll pick buds from the plum thickets or, or you know, dogwoods or willows or something like that. So, you know, you'll have chickens and bobwhite quail using the, the same cover ties. And, you know, bobwhite quail, they're looking for that perfect nest cover, mm -hmm. just like chickens are. Both, both girls of both species are very, very choosy and, and they're, they will utilize very good grassland cover to nest in too. So when we talk about, you, you referenced it being the umbrella species. By helping prairie chicken, it helps so much other things, including game, game birds. Right. And while the prairie chicken, you can argue the northern bobwhite, depending on who you're talking to, may have been historically America's game bird. Right. It seems like in recent decades, there's another bird that made its way on the landscape that, for better or worse, right. is almost kind of considered now the American game bird Right. now and that's sure. and that's the ringneck pheasant yeah where does the ringneck pheasant fit in because they aren't native to the right. to the ground here we can talk about brome grass and non-native plants mm -hmm. we're dealing with the non-native species which people have kind of adopted as the new american game bird right greater prairie chickens and ringneck pheasants do not mix and the reason for that is ringneck pheasants are a nest parasite so what that means is they will lay their eggs in a greater prairie chicken nest and the incubation period for a ringneck pheasant is shorter than for a greater prairie chicken and by just a couple days. Mm. So what happens is mama prairie chicken has a clutch of eggs that has a few ringneck pheasant eggs in it. And she will sit on that clutch and she will incubate them till she gets emergence, right? And what happens is the ringneck pheasant chicks will emerge first and she'll depart the nest with the ringneck pheasant young and then leave her young to perish. So that does not work. You can't conserve an organism when you're dealing with an exotic species that way. And one of the things that they say about exotic species and species recovery is that there's two drivers to extinction. There's the loss of habitat, which is number one, and number two is interactions with exotic species. And pheasants, ringneck pheasants, are an exotic species on the landscape. Now, that said, they are a fantastic game animal. They just are. And there are areas in Illinois where they do better. Historically, pheasants do better in, in the central part of Illinois. And it seems like in our contemporary times, ringneck pheasants are not doing well in Southern Illinois. And it just seems like they cannot establish and maintain populations. With pheasants being a nest parasite, right. do they only do that to prairie chicken nests or, or will they try that with other bird species as well? They, they can try it with other species, yes. But prairie chickens, it's, it's a very well-documented, um, we did a, a tremendously long um, duration study on the nesting characteristics of greater prairie chickens here at Prairie Ridge and they documented it repeatedly that they would have pheasant nests, uh, have pheasant eggs in nests and, and it was just a, a, a very very much well documented exotic species interaction with a game species. Do you think that the reason why we have the remnant prairie chickens down here in southern Illinois is because directly because the pheasants don't do well down here. Do you think if they moved down here like they have in central Illinois, mm -hmm. that we wouldn't even be talking about Prairie Ridge today? The answer to the question is why prairie chickens are here in Jasper County and in Marion County and downstate Illinois. The reason they are here is because this was a part of the state where we grew red top for seed. And red top is a Eurasian grass 
and it was an agricultural commodity that was grown almost extensively in this part of the part of the state. So right here is where the prairie chickens were most abundant in Illinois for the longest time because we had that agricultural system here. They raised red top for seed and they used it for forage and it was a very important commodity here. The cover was here. It was a surrogate prairie and the chickens stayed here. Elsewhere throughout Illinois, it was converted to row crop much quicker and then those populations blinked out. I find it very interesting that similar to brome grass being non-native, the red top being Eurasian grass is a non-native and we just talked about the importance of exotic wildlife right. and their impact on other wildlife. Right. It, it just goes to show that you can't just hit a blanket statement across the board mm -hmm. and say natives only. Right. It's like you referred to earlier, it may be the safest option when in doubt plant native because you know it was supposed to be here. That's right. But there are benefits to certain species. But how many times have we put or introduced a new plant species on the landscape thinking that we're doing, you know, mm -hmm. layman's work right. and all of a sudden, two decades f fast forward, we have Cerecia lespedeza all over the landscape that we're trying to eradicate and we just can't do it. Absolutely. And we did it with the best intentions. Yes, yes. And there's many examples of that. And you, the, for Prairie Ridge, you know, we knew that Red Top was here on the landscape. And that's the, that's the reason the chickens here, were here. And that was a cheap and available option. We could manage that. We knew how to manage red top historically, and it provided good surrogate prairie. Now, historically, and we're talking years and years ago, pre-settlement, you know, you would have had much more prairie across the Illinois landscape, and it would be much more varied, right? Today, we don't have that luxury to just plant a whole lot of native prairie and say, okay, that, that will serve all our grassland wildlife species because it doesn't. And what happens is you need to utilize all the tools in your toolbox, especially as a land manager. For me, I've got to have all the tools at my disposal to keep these species alive. Right. To the common person, they look out in the field of something like this, they don't, they don't see anything. Right, sure. You know, it takes a trained eye, and this is something that I had to kind of come to grips with when I got into this world, and I, I'm right. really passionate about it now. Right. But when I first got into bird hunting, I just see a field of Grass. stuff. Well, if you look out across this track, you know, we have, have a brome field we're standing in right now that's got sc scattered broom sedge through it. So you have kind of two different heights. So, you know, your brome's a little shorter than your broom sedge. And then, you know, over here to our left, we've got, you know, native prairie grasses and some different forbs. Um, you know, up on the ridge, you can see it's even, it's even more dense prairie grasses. And then we'll also have some red top and, and some different grass meadows mixed in. Those weedy areas are areas that the hens will take their young in the summer. And, you know, they have a lot of, a lot of fauna, a lot of biomass there of insects, which are very important for, for brood rearing. And then those legumes are, you know, leguminous species are very important for that protein for, for developing um, young chicks and, and, and for the adult bird. So here at Prairie Ridge, we have kind of various different cover types and all those different cover types serve um, the life history requirements of prairie chickens and other grassland birds. So it has to be very diverse uh, in general. Yeah. Why is some things such as brome acceptable on the native landscape right. while other non-natives aren't? We preach a lot of times, you know, move away from the non-natives, use native cover, use native cover and it will serve you the best. But in some cases, that is a challenge in and of itself to manage that native cover, right? We mm -hmm. all know that. And sometimes the non-native covers are very facile to utilize. You know, you the brome, you've got a very dependable height. You can structure it and manage it just like any other grassland. And every geographical area is a little different. You know, we're here in central Illinois, you know, kind of, kind of southern, south central Illinois. And our prairies here are very well watered, okay? We've got pretty rich soils. 
and our prairies get very, very robust. So our native cover has a tendency, even with management, to get very dense very quickly. Some of the non-native species, such as red top grass and brome grass, don't get as dense. Okay. And that is very key for grassland birds. So, you know, bobwhite quail, they don't really like real dense cover. Greater prairie chickens, they're, they just like, greater prairie chickens, I like to liken them to a, like a submarine. They just want to put that periscope, their head, their periscope up and look out across that grass and then come back down and stay in that cover because they're in predator avoidance mode all the time. And they can't do that in 10 foot tall native grass. Yeah, which makes a lot of sense, especially, you know, as us being hunters, when we go to areas that have population, huntable populations, right. one of the tricks is finding cover and grass that they can get in, feed. Yeah. It's, it's thick enough for security, but not so thick that they can't hear, see any threats or anything like that coming at them. That's exactly right. And it, the predator avoidance is, is very important for for grassland birds and, and they seek that certain cover type that you just described for that. And then they also seek other cover types for the different life history requirements. You know, if they're nesting, they don't want real, real dense cover either, but they want just enough duff and just enough height that they have nesting material, but then they also have some concealment but they can come and go if they need to. That's where I, I just find it fascinating that we have booming grounds in Southern Illinois. Yep. And as involved in the community that I'm in, I, di I wasn't aware of this until, until recently. Yep. And we're not even out there yet. We're not even into the cool stuff yet. And I'm already seeing similarities between other locations and other states managing for birds, such as these little vinyl strips on, on the fence. You can bet. You bet. I, I didn't even re realize that we did that for prairie chickens as well as sage grouse up in like Montana or something. Exactly. It's an exact same principle here. You know, it's to identify the top of that fence so we don't have a, a basically a line or a fence kill of a, a prairie chicken flying into it. So we want to do everything we can to protect them. And part of our management here on the area is we have a, a small grazing program and, uh, you know, we have to, to, uh, encourage the protection of those organisms because we have to have a, the animals fenced you know right. so so this is the route that you take when you're doing these tours is that is that a fair way to describe them a tour of people that want to yeah. come in bird watchers what ha hunters you, you bet you bet uh, they want to come see the booming grounds they want to see the the dance the right. all the stuff that you hear about these prairie chickens yes so this is this is the walk that you take them on yes the only difference it would be in the dark of night and okay. it would be cold and, um, you know, it would be very foreign. I mean, if you think about it, a lot of my groups, they come from Chicago and, you know, for them to get away to the country and then come see a bird that is often a lifer for them, you know, this is a, quite the event. But it's a natural phenomenon, Nick. It really is. It's just really an amazing thing. Greater Prairie chickens are so charismatic and that, that spring booming activity in their displays is just really cool. Greater prairie chickens are, are very flighted. So they're, they're very adept at just flushing, getting up and flying two or three miles, no problem. Whereas bobwhite quail, you know, they're kind of a home body. They're not gonna be very strong they're not flighted. Explorers. They're not yeah. explorers. Now, greater prairie chickens are, and they actually have periods during the year when they explore more than others. And that, that's exactly what they do. The males, if you think about it, if they want to breed, they gotta find a place where they can get to be the top dog on that booming ground the quickest. So there'll be a period of time in the spring where the males are really exploring and going to different areas to try to establish booming grounds and try to breed. So, you know, for a track to be two or three miles off from another is, is no problem for chickens. Really? Yeah. Example I have is, um, our Marion County unit is 30 some miles away from here and it's complete ag land and, and, and timber lands and, and streams between here and there. Okay, so not a grassland corridor. We have had birds that have flown from Jasper County here where we're standing today to Marion County 30 miles away 
and then we've documented them turning around and coming right on back. Really? So yeah, we've documented males that have left here and gone to Marion County, and we've documented hens that have transited back and forth also. Right. When we talk about birds, especially the meat quality, you know, you have red meat birds and you have white meat birds. The way right. it's always it made sense to me is the red meat are the one, the flyers. Mm -hmm. they, they need that extra blood in their muscle tissue to be able to fly long distances. Right. The white meat ones are the homebodies, the non-explorers. Sure, sure. Is that why you have prairie chickens and sharp-tailed grouse, they're red meat, because they will fly the distances like that. Even though they may not do it on a daily basis, they're right. capable of doing it. I, I believe you're, you're correct. And both of those species are strong dispersers and strong flyers, and, and, and you see that. And it's just part of their physiology to allow them to, to do that. Yeah, and it makes sense historically, you know, when back when we used to have strong, you know, blizzard conditions and winter systems that would move across Illinois, you would even see the chickens, they would actually not necessarily migrate, but they would fly a long distance to get out of, you know, conditions that were very, very challenging. They would go snowbird in Florida and then come back. <laughs> I, I'm sure they wish they could have, right. but yeah, We're exactly. in Illinois, right? I hear that's a thing here. It is, it's a, snowbird it's a thing, in Florida. it's a thing, you right. bet, you bet. <laughs> This booming ground is not completed for the season yet. This is early winter, right? It's got a, got a tilled break all the way around it. So I've mowed it off, because it was tall grass at one time, mowed it off short, and then we're gonna come back and we're gonna burn this completely off. So what we're left with is a complete bare ground situation. And if you think about it, that makes it very easy for the birds to see each other you know, and they, they are absolutely not encumbered by any grass. They're there where the hens can see them, each male can see each other, and uh, that's what they're looking for. Natural booming grounds are areas where you have a lot of wind erosion, okay? You may have areas where the wind has knocked the grass down, or it may be a real thin soiled site. It may be a, a site where a rancher has, has fed some hay and it's just flat and bare and plastered down. It's been an area <clears throat> where you've had bison or you've had cattle that have grazed it real short. Um, sometimes it's just a little patch in the prairie that's just buffalo grass. You know, it's short buffalo grass and, you know, it may be the top of a hill in Kansas that it's just windblown and the, the pauperate soils and it can't grow and that's, that's exactly where they'll be. So ultimately it's just ground that they can actually see the other birds right? and they can pretty much have their royal rumble to figure out the, the winner and who gets to have 90% of the, of the women. That's right. And it is absolutely a royal rumble because <laughs> it starts, the males will start working these booming grounds in midwinter. So in February or so, right now they're flocked up because we're kind of working in January now. But they will start visiting these booming grounds in February, and they're already fighting with each other. And there's a little sparring to determine who they're is that up. top dog. They're warming up. So they, once breeding season gets here, we have a kind of period in March where we call the March Shuffle. And that's where the birds are really finalizing who's going to be the alpha male, and who's going to be on the periphery of the lect, and who's going to be on which lect. And it's a, it, they really get down to it. And if you are on the booming ground and watching the birds, you'll see males that'll be paired up to each other. And basically what they are, they are sparring partners and they have fought all winter long to be exactly where they're sitting. And they will face each other at, the, at their territory boundary. Okay, it's like country to country, territory boundary. And they'll say basically, buddy, don't you cross my line. And they will keep that territory defended. And they, that's where they display within that territory. It's a fun, it's absolutely fascinating. Just for those people that don't know, describe what a prairie chicken does, the dance, the ritual, all that fun stuff that like sure. just kind of gets everybody's imagination working. <laughs> so this, this is, this is one of the booming grounds. We have about 10 different booming grounds here in the Jasper County unit, but this is the one that I take a lot of different groups to and we sit out in the blinds and we watch the spring display. Now, the males, uh, greater prairie chickens, conduct a, a spring kind of mating ritual and they have a very elaborate courtship and, and uh, it's, it's just really a, a phenomenon. But greater prairie chickens are lek breeders. So what that means is the males will come to an area that's, that's open 
and where they can see each other and they can be heard readily and they will display there. And they jostle for territories on that booming ground or that lek and the individual that is the, the top dog, the alpha male, he will establish his territory in the very center of the lek and that individual will do 90% of the, the mating with the females. So he has really got the moves, man. So 90%. So there's a lot of incentive for a man to take top dog position in the middle of this, <laughs> this leg, right? That's right. That's right. And then the hens, they will come in and they are, they are later in the period of the, the booming and the display. And they will kind of come in and they'll see the males and kind of they'll visit the booming ground briefly and they'll move off. But then later in the season, about the first week in April, they'll come onto the booming ground and they are very focused and they will breed at that time. And when I mean focused, they'll come on, they'll breed, and then they immediately start the nesting period. So they'll go out and they'll start nesting. Usually the next day they'll lay their first egg. Gotcha. So now what the males do is they dance. They just absolutely do. They will stomp their feet, which you can actually audibly hear from the blinds. You hear you can hear them stomping their feet and they'll fl inflate air sacs or timpani on the sides of their heads. Those are those big yellow balls that everybody sees on the mounds That's or pictures. Absolutely. And they're just, they just like, they look like the morning sun. Okay. Great big air sacs on the side of their heads and they will boom. So they'll go. So it's a real, almost kind of ghost like. Sounds like blowing over the top of an old pop bottle, something like that. Now they have another sound that they make. They will whoop and they ex oftentimes we'll use that for the hens. When the hens come on, they get super excited and they do a lot of flutter jumping. So they'll jump up and flatter their wings and, and they'll boom and then they'll whoop, 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 whoop. And they'll, they'll basically whoop at the hens. And it's basically to get their attention, anything they can to attract the ladies, right? Right. And they also have what they call pinna that they'll put up on the, ta on the backs of their heads. They're specialized feathers. So they'll boom and they'll stomp their feet and they'll put their pinna up and they kind of have their tail, which is a bit upright, kind of like a turkey to some degree. And they, they basically will follow the hens around the booming ground. And if you look at a male greater prairie chicken without his pinna up, they, they are basically folded back along the nape of his neck. Okay, so they're there. And then the air sacs kind of fold up completely and hide within the plumage of, of, of the neck of the bird. And they sit a little bit in front of uh, the pinna. The pinna are almost on the very back of the animal's neck. What's the end goal here? Like at, at, at the shining light, what are you working for? What keeps Bob Gillespie motivated on <laughs> saving the prairie chickens, which has been going on for, you know, 60, 70 years. We've, right. been, we've been trying to do this. Right. What's the best case scenario or outcome out of this? The best case scenario is that we have a population that is durable, um, and what I mean is that we have a population that is genetically diverse and is provided with all the different habitats that they need for their life history. So that's what drives me, is to produce that habitat that those animals need and produce it in the quality and quantity that, that's most important for them to stay here in Illinois. It can be tough getting someone who doesn't hunt to comprehend why we care about the success of a species outside of just having enough of them to hunt. They don't see or witness the amount of time, resources, and money that we put into preparing for and chasing these experiences all over the country. In the same breath of non-hunters claiming that we only care about conservation so that we have something to shoot at later, they will also try to place blame on hunters because they don't understand how the habitat and conservation process actually works. They continuously fail to acknowledge the fact that the hunting industry far outpaces them in actually paying for the work and programs needed to keep these species on the landscape. It's not even closer up for debate which group of people actually funds these projects. However, hunters also need to take stock of their own individual impact as proven in this video of the prairie chickens within Illinois. 
The state of Illinois has a history and tradition of upland hunting and the population was still decimated to this extent, so it's not enough to continue to try and just pass on the hunting tradition to the next generation. Be it the over-harvesting from hunting, overproduction in mass agriculture, failed governmental programs, or just the non-interest from the average citizen, numerous species are beyond recovery and this particular population of birds will never be huntable in the state again. What's really infuriating is that it's still happening. The state of Illinois is already barely over 2,000 acres of prairie, and yet they just recently bulldozed Bell Bowl Prairie outside of the Rockford Airport, despite public outcry and even available alternatives. It's one thing for people to make a mistake and learn from it. It's a completely different thing to not only make the mistake, but continue to repeat it over and over again. Bob mentions the work to save these birds should continue to act as a billboard for other species. My question is why wasn't the billboard raised when the heath hen was lost on the east coast? Or the fact that the lesser prairie chicken was just listed on the federal endangered species list this past year. At what point do people both hunters and non-hunters alike stop looking at billboards on the side of the highway and actually take the exit to get off that direction? No matter what, if non-hunters such as birders want to continue to view these animals in the wild, or hunters want to continue to be able to chase birds with their dogs in the fall, we all need to come together and realize that once it's lost, it's lost. There's only so many mistakes we are allowed to make before there is no more forgiveness.